The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales radio show with me, Charles Christian. We have another fantastic interview coming up shortly. This week it's with award-winning horror and urban fantasy writer Nancy A. Collins. Full details in a moment. But before we do, let's have a quick anniversary. Did you know that January 1652 saw the opening of the first coffee shop in the Western world? It was located in a shed in the churchyard of St Michael's, just off Cornhill in the city of London, and was run by a Greek called Pasqua Rosé, and was apparently so successful it was soon serving up to 600 dishes of coffee a day. They didn't use cups in those days. Samuel Pepys mentions drinking coffee there in his diary. The original building was destroyed in the Great Fire of London in 1666 and rebuilt a few years later as the Jamaica Coffee House. That building is also now long gone, although you can still find a pub there called the Jamaica Wine House on the site. There's even a blue plaque on the wall commemorating Pasqua Rose's original coffee shop. Starbucks it may not be, but the owner was also a dab hand at publicity producing a handbill or flyer entitled The Virtue of the Coffee Drink. Here are just some of the claims made about coffee 360 years ago. It is excellent to prevent and cure the dropsy, gout and scurvy. It is known by experience to be better than any other dry in drink for people in years or children who have any running humours upon them, such as the king's evil. It is a most excellent remedy against the spleen, hypochondriac winds and the like. It will prevent drowsiness and make one fit for business. And therefore you are not to drink it after supper unless you intend to be watchful, for it will hinder sleep for three or four hours. So there's good advice for you there. If you have a child who's got the king's evil, give them coffee. Now for our interview, and once again we are delving into the realms of geek and pop culture as we talk to Nancy A. Collins. Nancy has written more than 20 novels and novellas, as well as numerous short stories. She has also worked on several comic books, including a two-year stint on the Swamp Thing series and a notable first as the first woman writer working on the Vampirella comic series. She is a recipient of the Bram Stoker Award and the British Fantasy Award and is best known for her groundbreaking vampire series, Sonia Blue, which now, over 30 years ago, heralded the rise of the popular urban fantasy genre. Collins is the author of the best-selling Sunglasses After Dark, the Southern Gothic collection Knuckles and Tales, and her most recent novel is Left Hand Magic the second instalment in her Golgotham urban fantasy series. It's my great pleasure to be talking to Nancy Collins. Well, and I'm very pleased and and flattered that you wanted to speak to me. (laughs) I I say your CV is, is brilliant. And I mean, it's one of those things that sadly I found that People wanted me to write about technology for lawyers, and I rather got distracted from writing fiction. But <laughs> your, yours is a career arc I would have taken had circumstances been different. Oh, well, bump, bumpy as it is, <laughs> or yeah. has been. Uh, yeah, I mean, what got you started off as a writer? Well, I was kind of born that way, uh, to quote uh, Lady Gaga. <laughs> and... Um, I always, uh, my family said, yeah, Nancy's always going to be a writer. <laughs> and that's, that, that, it was just, just, just assumed because apparently when I was three years old, before I knew how to read and write, I would draw stories and then I would stand next to my my parents and grandparents and anyone else had to be visiting at the time. And I would tell them what was going on in the story. 
<laughs> and and I basically taught myself to read and write because I got tired of waiting for uh, an adult to read me a story. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't a family where you know there were other writers in it, or there was a tradition of storytelling or anything. Well, well, kind of. I mean, um, uh, one of, it. it, it Creativity did run in the family, as did education. My great grandmother was a uh, um, educator, uh, yeah. and she had a, a liberal edu- a liberal arts education, especially for the time. Uh, she was a high school um, uh, elementary, then high school teacher. My great aunt was a uh, uh, language teacher, specializing in Latin and Greek. And um, one of my uh, relatives on my grandfather's side of the family was uh, Louisa May Alcott, who wrote Little Women. Yeah. And uh, also uh, the poet and Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Right. Okay. So I'm, there I'm was a- some of that in the family. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm suitably impressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, uh, but yeah, it, it did. It did run in the family, and and I came from a family that uh, valued illiteracy, mm-hmm. which is not always the case in in the South in America. Yeah, um, especially when when it comes to women. Yeah, um, and um, and my mother's attitude is: I don't care what she's reading as long as she was reading. And then making the jump from schoolgirl hobbyist writer. Mm-hmm. How fan, did, fan girl, I think is what they call it. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but how did how did you sort of move into professional writing? Well, well, uh, through fanzines in the seventies. I'm I'm sixty one, so my um, I kind of came of age during the um, the emergence of the um, fan culture. Yeah. Uh, in in both comics and science fiction uh, fandom. Uh, fanzines. Um, I, I, yeah, I've actually, I actually put out fanzines myself. I, 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 I know how to use a spirit duplicator machine. I know how to, I've, <laughs> I, I have in my past cut and pasted uh, stencils. Yeah. Yeah. They run on a memory. I used to own I, a memoriograph. Oh, I remember. Uh, oh <laughs> <yep>. yes. <laughs> I remember them. I remember them. Yeah. Yes. Oh yes. yeah. That all the pre Xerox. You know, yeah, pre-digital technology. Yeah, I, I grew, I came up through the, um, um, came yeah. up through the trenches on that, <laughs> and uh, a lot of reasons I was into fanzines is because that was a way for me to um, publish short stories. Yes, and yeah. um, yeah, and have someone besides my immediate family and friends <laughs> be able to read them, and. Um, and that's how, and that's how I, I kind of got into it, and that's how I eventually ended up becoming friends and making friends with people who later became writers, mm-hmm. or were writers at the time. Like one of the first, um, two of the first professional writers I ever met were Roger Zelazny and um, Carl Edward Wagner, and um, uh, Carl lived in the. Uh, he was a regional. You know, he he lived in in. Uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, and I was growing up in in uh, Arkansas, and um, for a while lived in 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 Memphis, Tennessee. And so when I would do convention, do the science fiction conventions in that area, I would invariably run into Carl at some point. And Carl was like one of the first uh, professional writers I ever spoke to, and one of the first to ever give me any uh, like professional advice such as like don't go with a vanity press <laughs> and, and, and and your agent should never ever charge you you know you know basically yeah. just you know steering me away from from all the all the um uh, pits and trips off artists yeah. and grift and grifters that that, yeah. that very much are, uh, prey on you know young ignorant little writers that are out there yeah so sadly still the same still, as it is today yeah, yeah they just have a different they just wear a different Sheep's, yeah. their, their 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 sheepskin is now digital, <laughs> and, and um, hide their wolfiness, and um, um, no, but I, and then I ended up somehow over the years, somewhere along the line, ended up falling in with the cyberpunk group. Like mm-hmm. uh, um, one of my one of my um, friends and um, 
mentors was John Shirley. Yeah. Who who is was the uh, the writer responsible for actually William Gibson's Neuromancer being published, and uh, so I was hanging out with people like him and Bill Gibson, uh, Bruce Sterling, Lou Shiner, uh, um, Rudy Rucker, and the thing is, I wasn't good enough. I w- I was not. Um, my 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 science foo and my math foo is not was not good enough to be a science fiction writer, even a cyberpunk writer. So I ended up slotting myself into this, uh, ended up being part of the, the splatterpunk scene at the time. Mm-hmm. And so I ended up becoming more a, a fantasy, um, horror and fantasy writer. And yeah. somewhere along the line, accidentally invented urban fantasy. So, yes, I was going to say, <laughs> you're, 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 I mean, it's everywhere at the moment, but you were, you know, a good, Ten years before that, with um, oh yeah, the and first of the Sonya Boom, I invented it. Yeah, I didn't. I had. I, I just thought I was writing a vampire novel at the time. <laughs> yeah. So, and and um, um, and then I uh, and then that led me into to comics, which I'd always had a love for and had a deep abiding uh, interest in since I was like you know like four or five. Uh, and so it is basically all my all my geeky childish desires were made were made uh, were made manifest and and I had the benefit of becoming um, counting as two of my mentors um, when I first got into the business um, after John uh, one of my mentors was Robert block mm-hmm. who uh, became yeah. like a he was a another grandfather to me and 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 will Eisner both yeah. of them and I, I miss both men just tremendously so but they uh they accepted me and welcomed me into the fold accepted me as a peer and um that had that was that was quite uh, uh you know quite a thing <laughs> yeah well he would be yes robert block in particular i mean he is legendary in the stuff he's written over the years oh yeah 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 his his um his short fiction um that was basically how i taught myself how to write short stories was studying bob (laughs) and uh, him and him and richard matheson yeah yeah and the comic books bit now that's always an intriguing part because obviously there's there's the two sides to it. There's the illustrator side, and there's the uh, person who writes the script for it. And oh, we're disposable as Kleenex. Too. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, uh, Neil Gaiman and I have been friends for almost thirty years now, but we both are. You know, it's just like we're both well aware of how easy it is for us. You know, you know. We are suffered yeah. by the industry, because <laughs> <laughs> and it's um, because it's it's a visual medium, and the yeah. artist will always have the upper hand in that. Yeah, and if you can write and draw, like someone like Mac Magnola, who's been an old friend of mine for few years now, um, you you know, you're in like Flynn. Yeah, so um, they'll never get rid of you. Yeah, because you know, yeah, uh, but you've got you've got it all. Yes, if you you, yes. you can draw and write. Yes, yeah, but but writers, we're 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 uh, we walk the tightrope. There's you know, <laughs> the, you know, and, and 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 unfortunately, comics has this horrible habit of like they'll go, well, we've got you know, you have all these it, have all these titles. Let's just give eight of them to the same writer. Hmm. Yeah, and you'll have you know, and 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 let him write them for the next ten years, <laughs> and or twenty years, and you're just, and then they go, well, I, we can't figure out why our sales are down. I said, well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, they're not doing as well as they should, hmm. and because they just kind of, in some ways, stories are just, and you know, the writing is just ancillary to them. Yeah, as long as uh, the art, uh, well, sales and the art. Uh, are the two biggest things in the storyline, which now is so much of it is done through editorial. And it wouldn't be that big an issue if I, if most of the editors nowadays were actually had a background in writing. I didn't have any issues with Dick Diodondo or uh, Marv Wolfman or uh, 
you know, Tony Isabella or anyone like that telling me, you know, not that any of them did, but if they did, uh, I wouldn't have, if, it, you know, yeah. you know, have any issue with them telling me what to do editorially because they've been in the trenches. Yeah. Yeah. I can respect them for that. But when some guy who's, you know, I, I don't know what he's done to <laughs> be the editor because it sure wasn't writing. <laughs> you know? Yes. Uh, uh, or, or art for that matter. And, um, you know, I'm assuming it's marketing or they, you know, something like that. And, and so I don't really have much faith in, in, in the editorial telling me what to do because they don't, they're not, they don't know the, they don't know how it works. Yeah. Now with, with the comic books, I mean, you've worked on Swamp Thing, which has been around a long time. Oh, yes. But has been given a boost recently by being. Is it on? Is it Amazon? It's on. Uh, well, it, it was uh, originally it was on DC Universe, which was a failed attempt at a streaming platform for DC. Right. Uh, and then when that collapsed, <laughs> they moved it over to. Uh, they split up the, the, some of the stuff that was on there, uh, like Doom Patrol. They took over to HBO Max because mm-hmm. that's more adult. In, uh, adult content and Swamp Thing, which was always kind of designed to kind of like be more like mainstream, mm-hmm. uh, that got taken over here in America. I don't know where uh, in, in the UK, but it it was uh, most recently broadcast on uh, the CW, and now now I think it's being re- redone in, in on Amazon. So or in the UK, it's on Amazon certainly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, as part of Prime, but but yeah, and it'll probably and I I think they've, there's a Blu-ray version and all that. So yeah, a, a, eventually I'll see some royalty off of that because mm. they use one of my characters theoretically, um, oh, uh, in the in the show, and that's a and that's an interesting because the 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 guy who's a showrunner on it, Mark for Hayden, uh, I've known Mark for forty years. <laughs> and we got the job i was going you better use some of my characters <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes um and um so yeah the um uh, uh character of uh, lieutenant uh, uh general sunderland's or, or sunderland's uh wife is actually she's actually a combination of two characters i created uh uh, Connie Sunderland and and Mrs. Sunderland, so yeah, um, Bubbles. Um, but uh, uh, but according to the royalty check I got, it was for Bubbles. So, but <laughs> the, uh, but they actually folded two characters together to create her. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But they did utilize some other aspects from my run I, that I noted, such as making um, Liz um, uh, a lesbian, which mm-hmm. was from my run. And, uh, and and I noted some um, physical changes to Swamp Thing, which uh, which also dated back to my run. So that was that was interesting. So mm-hmm. I didn't get I didn't get a thank you in the, at, in the end credits at the end <laughs> of the series, but you know uh, that's just the way it is. I mean, I'm I'm just lucky. You yeah. Know, they. You know, but um, we're just lucky they thanked Lynn and Bernie <laughs> <laughs> and Alan. Uh, maybe they didn't think Alan, uh, but yeah. But uh, Steve Bissett's one of my best friends yeah. now, and and and, and I'm, I'm friends with Alan, and, and all of us, all of us who have, to- for the most part, most of us who have told toiled in that in the Swamp Thing Vineyard know each other. Yeah, you know, had some kind of connection, and um, I became friends with Marty. Pasco before he, uh, shortly before he passed away, rest his soul. And I was good friends with, um, with Bernie and Lynn and, um, um, and Alan, Steve. And, um, and I still, uh, have, um, keep contact with Charlie Vess and, yeah. uh, Russ Braun and, and, uh, and Kim DeMolder, who's my inker during that whole run. So, yeah, we're all, yeah. And you also, and still with the comic books, you uh, were with Vampirella. Yes, I was the first woman to write Vampirella. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, not the only one now, but I was, I'm still the first and only woman to have written Swamp Thing. Um, but I, uh, I was the first woman to write Vampirella. I was going to say, did you bring a different perspective to it? Because, I mean, Vampirella is a sort of 
typical, I don't know, teenage male fantasy type person. Well, I, I think so, because probably the, the first person to ever write the, and I, I maybe I'm speaking out of school, but I'm probably the first person to ever write the character who didn't pleasure herself to the character. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I always felt that um, uh, I was friends with Archie Goodwin. He was all. He was another one of my mentors. He was one of my mentors over at DC, and um, I was friends with Archie. And I always felt like Archie was looking over my shoulder the whole time when I was working on that book. Yeah. And, um, uh, but yeah, I think I, I think I, I I made her very uh, a bit more uh, um, business. Not necessarily business like, but it's like her. You know, yeah, she. I took her back to her original costume because it was, you know, you know, play the hand you're dealt. Yes. <laughs> because people, every time you try to change that costume, people just get upset. Yeah. And um, and it's and she's trademarked that way. Yeah. So she has to wear it at some point to keep, to keep the trademark going. But um, um. I like to think that I, I just, I, you know, I wrote her. I wrote her as, you know, someone who, you know, this is this is what she does. This is her business. She's she's good at what she does, and um, she doesn't pay attention to how she's dressed half the time. Yeah. Because <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. and I actually put her in other clothes. You know, so that's just what she wears when she's fighting. Yeah. You've also done projects like Jason versus Leatherface yes. and a Predator mm -hmm. book and an Army of Darkness book. I mean, yes, I've done some uh, – I've done – well, m mostly comics is working in, in licensed property. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, all of those I enjoyed working on because for the most part I was left the hell alone. Yeah. Um, uh, Jason versus Leatherface, I ended up getting that because Dave Imhoff – who was the marketing director over at New Line Cinema, liked my work and liked me personally. Uh, Dave later ended up uh, retiring after he landed uh, Lord of the Rings for New Line. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, that's it. I'm out. Tap yeah. me out. <laughs> I've done my job. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I, occasionally I would see his name credited on some – at the in credits of, like, uh, pinball machines. Mm. <laughs> you know, like for the Adams family and stuff like that. It was it was always it was always kind of and special things to do. have all of us scrolling up on the pinball machine. Um, but he liked my work and he wanted me to do Jason versus Leatherface. And my friend Jim Salakrup was editor at the time at Tops, and so I did that, and basically left me the hell alone to do it. And. Um, it, it, it's to, I'm, I'm extremely proud of that that series because for, for one, it has my favorite review, which was basically this is much better than it has any any need to be. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, uh, I was at a convention, and um, and I was sitting at my table and suddenly this. And the, you know, like the the sun was blotted out, and I look up and there's this huge guy with a big beard standing over me. You know, it looked like he was in his you know like late forties, early fifties. And he goes, "Are you Nancy Collins?" And I went, "Uh huh." <laughs> and he and he holds out Jason versus Leatherface, the first issue, and he goes, "You wrote this?" And I went. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting goes, to see what's going to happen, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he shook, sticks his hand out and he goes, I'm Gunnar Hansen, the original Leatherface. Ah, brilliant. And I want to shake your hand because you're one of the few people who understand Leatherface mentality and that family dynamic. And I and I thought, well, that's the best review I could probably ever get out of this. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Gunnar and I ended up being friends. We became friends after that. And later I ended up running into Bill Mosley uh, years later mm -hmm. and um, introduced myself. And I said, yeah, I, I actually did something involving 
Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And she said, oh, what'd you do? And I said, well, I wrote this miniseries called Jason versus Leatherface. And his eyes got real wide. And he goes, Rob keeps that on the set all the time. <laughs> oh, so, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. So Ro- apparently Rob Zombie likes my work too. So <laughs> that's, that's good. That's good, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that was, yeah, considering, you know, the. It, and I and I enjoyed doing Army of Darkness for pretty much the same reason. The I got left the hell alone, and enjoyed working on it. And uh, what else did I do? Oh, the pun, uh, the Predator. Yeah, uh, that's actually um, uh, that's actually the Predator meets Jesse James. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I never come out and say it's Jesse James, but it's you know a teenage Jesse James. Yeah, set during the Civil War. So. And, and and basically, I was left alone to do what I was wanted to do, and I didn't have some idiot from the uh, studio just trying to send me notes the entire time. Yeah. Let's talk about some of your books on your own right. Tell us about the Golgotham. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Golgotham is my love letter to every um, neighborhood I've been gentrified out of. <laughs> um, starting with uh, uh, the French Quarter in New Orleans. I mean, I lived in the French Quarter in New Orleans. I lived on the Lower East Side in New York City. I lived in Little Five Points in Atlanta. All of them ended up. I ended up getting chased out of them because of gentrification. And um, yeah, I was one of the artists that came in. You know, came in and yeah. help make the neighborhood more livable and then all the yuppies came in and chased us the hell out. Yeah. yeah. And um um yeah, and it's basically set in it's an urban fantasy set in the uh supernatural ghetto of New York City. Uh, which is basically all the various supernatural or mythological creatures and characters that that are attendant to the various ethnic groups that settled in New York City mm-hmm. uh, live in this neighborhood. Uh, uh, and, the, and, and it's not hidden. It's not like, oh, no one knows it's there. They sell T-shirts. <laughs> um, they have they have a, tour, a, a, a bureau, tourism bureau. People go down there to, you know, do dirty deeds dirt cheap, so to speak. You know, you can go down there and buy spells or you can go – they have a – a version of Bourbon Street, which is basically, you know, a bunch of, you know, whorehouses for people who are interested and in, got people who are half animal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, you know, it, and it's a city state. It's a city state within the city of New York. Very much not unlike, uh, say, um, Va- the Vatican. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and um, well, actually, and, quite a, quite a bit different to the Vatican. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit different from the Vatican. Yeah, but um, but the same concept. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, yes. of a, 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 a city state within a larger and yes. within an existing state. Yeah, and um, and it's run by a race of born witches you know, called the Chimera, who are you know six have six fingers and cat pupils. They're kind of like what we would think of as fairy folk, and yeah. and um, and there's centaurs and satyrs and and dryads and um, very you know, mermaids and various other things that live there. Yeah. And uh, and it's kind of an uneasy um, uh, economic and social agreement with the humans that surround them. Yeah. And uh, and. And basically, there's people trying to instigate racial and and ethnic uh, tensions and cleansings, and and it goes back and forth. But it's but the the core of the story is a is a love effect, love story between a human artist and a warlock prince, and uh, and it also involves a talking flying cat that's got no fur. So oh, well, that's most yeah. of the thing. So yeah. it's it's kind of like. My it, it's my attempt. At, uh, I was very influenced by stuff like Bell Book and Candle, and I Married a Witch and stuff like that. As a kid, I loved those. You know, yeah. Uh, Here comes Mr. Jordan, kind of the romantic, uh, fan, uh, romantic fa- uh, fantasies. Uh, you know, and so 
this was kind of my way of trying to combine all that within the structure of the ur- of urban fantasy story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For people who aren't familiar with the term uh, urban fantasy, how would you define it? Uh, my personal definition is it's fantastical elements within the within the everyday, which doesn't. In some ways, it's very similar to magic realism, but not quite as literary. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so it's more like, um, uh, you know, the the you know, uh, elves and elves and and specters and whatever, and vampires, werewolves. They're all around. Shapeshifters. They're here. They're they're in our daily lives. They're living. Yeah. They're living alongside us. And and it's up to the individual writer as to whether people are aware of it or they're unaware of it. Yeah. And I, since I created the the original concept of they're here and we won't we refuse to see them, the idea that they're here and they're exploiting us, our our own blindness to them. I decided you know, with I went to both extremes of the ones where they're they're the secret masters behind manipulating humanity and mm-hmm. to basically feed on us either physically or psychically or Golgotham where they're selling you t-shirts. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But, but I mean, the key element is it's in, if you like the real world, it's not in a contemporary, contemporary, the contemporary world, whether it's America, the UK, wherever. Yeah. As opposed to the sort of completely fantastic worlds of, High yeah, fantasy of, and things, yes. Yeah, of to- uh, unlike Tolkien or yeah. anything like that, or or Narnia, yeah. um, or, or Harry. Po- it, it, Harry Potter is very close to to urban fantasy, mm. really. I, I would say it's urban fantasy for children because it is theoretically set in con- yeah. a contemporary version. Yeah, and and and, and Golgotha, as as you read the books, you realize this is not really our world. It's it's an alternate reality that's very similar because things aren't, you know, things diverged historically at some point, but it bears enough resemblance to our world that you can identify with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is all, because, because all fictional worlds are alternate realities. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, yes. I mean, um, as is always pointed out, whenever you see something like uh, Sherlock Holmes, the the streets aren't littered with horse, which they would be in the <laughs> in the yes, real world. Yeah. yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Everything's a bit cleaner, hygienic. Yes. Yeah, yeah people bathe apparently on a daily basis in those shows, <laughs> which is, I find, you know, I, 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 I'm a history major and and one of my things was was victorian england and yeah i was going yeah these people they seem to wear clothes that don't stink and yep. yeah yeah <laughs> yep indeed <laughs> yes oh, and they when you go into their go into their houses you can see things as opposed to just being like you know like kind of dark and dingy and you know everything everything covered with a a slight um tinge of whatever oil they're burning in their lamps <laughs> yes yes so you tend to forget because yes. you can't if you were doing it in a movie you'd be able to see nothing if you had it true to life so you always have the the paraffin lamp that appears to be a 500 watt bulb or something in there yes yes yeah my my well i i grew up in rural arkansas and i knew people that lived not much differently than they did 100 150 years ago Mm. and people still had hurricane lamps that were their source of you know kerosene lamps and outdoor plumbing and oh yes there's delights Mm. now another thing i've got a note here about you researching folklore and mythology. Yes. I've and and I'm that. guessing that is the fact that when you are writing urban fantasy and you have all these creatures in there, you do have to actually get it right, you know, because your, yes. your audience is a niche audience in the sense that they will have read this stuff and there's nothing they like. You know, it's like when you see people critiquing science fiction, you know, they... 
they've got the warp drive wrong you know people... well it's like it's like westerns you know people you get, you get the history wrong or get the yeah. guns wrong yeah. clothing wrong and it, and that's one thing i've always told people who want you know well what can you tell me well, i want to be writers just like doesn't matter, doesn't matter if you're making everything up and it's all set in another world you better know you know, better be grounded in some form of reality in terms of research yeah and um because the minute you know uh, that uh, suspension of disbelief is um, very tenuous. Yes. Uh, with your between you and your reader, and the minute that is broken, you've lost their faith. Oh yes, yeah. And they'll be looking to poke holes in what you're doing from then on in. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's I, I've, yeah I've, I've I've done tons of re- especially in regards to vampires and werewolves and um. Uh, fairy folk and stuff like that over the years and you know and uh uh southern you know southern um uh, legends and stuff like that um um that kind of folklore to to kind of weave into my own uh work and and also you know get some inspiration giving some ideas and um uh, and you know get figure out what because some of the, some of it with oral storytelling, there's what 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 is it in the story that's being handed down over and over and over again that that is actually making it spark with different generations to be continued to be handed down? What is that element that seems to speak to people? Mm-hmm. Trying to parse that out in the creatures you have written about, what would be your favorite? Well, or put it another way, if you could come back or transform shapeshift into a fantasy creature, what would it be? Well, I think in terms of the, I think the the most recent one that I I enjoyed working on because there's very little in it of it in in Western mythology, uh, as I had a race of uh, uh, were dolphins, and right. they pop up in 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 in. In the South Pacific, you know, Pacifica mythology, quite a bit, and where sharks, you know, they come up on land to come look for you. And um, it was in a story, a uh, uh, novella I wrote, short novel called Absalom's Wake. And uh, it was kind of like what the, the concept is: what if Herman Melville decided to write? Instead of writing Moby Dick, he decided to create the Cthulhu mythos. Ooh, yes. <laughs> It'd be a lot shorter for one. <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, but basically, there's a, a one of the characters is is a were dolphin named Coral, uh, who's the best friend and possibly the you know, a blood relation of the narrator, Jonah. Yeah. Um, Jonah Paget, and. Um, he um, uh, he appears you know, kind of like a, as a guardian figure for him, and you know, when he's in his human form, he's completely hairless. I mean, he you know, yeah, and uh, and, and and but he's got these tattoos on him that kind of you know like tribal tattoos that almost kind of like underwater look like the markings on a on a dolphin. Yeah, and when he's and he always wears a st- stocking cap over his head, and the reason for that is because he has a blowhole. Yeah. <laughs> so that if he wants to pass for human, he has to cover that up. And uh, but he's a but he's a good character. He's he like he, like Quickway. Quickway was a cannibal, but hey, he was a, he was actually a decent person. Yeah. You know all you know that eating people besides, but um, but he's a. You know, he's a um, uh, one of his things is he's he's a harpooner, harpoonist on this boat, and to the point where he can actually jump on a whale. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is set during whaling times, and and um, yeah. and then the villains of the of the piece are uh, a tribe of were sharks who um, actually climb. You know, they, they you know. They uh, climb up the the chains of the ship and get on and get on board, 
and um, but but yeah, they've they're they're quite disturbing <laughs> and that you know they when they're when they're fully human they still look like cannibals because they've got the the, the filed teeth and everything mm, but yeah but when they're when they're getting about what they're doing their gills pop out and their teeth and their mouths expand and the eyes go back like a doll's eyes <laughs> and so they're quite they're quite disturbing and um um and then there's um, my version of the great old ones are kind of like jellyfish. Yeah. 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 So that's that they're they're down below. They're the ocean born. And um, but but yeah, I had a great time writing that one because it was I, I read Moby Dick. I read Moby Dick three times. <laughs> and, which which is three times more than most people. Um, yeah. Well, well, even I, even those who start it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I have to appreciate um, Mel- Melville was was documenting a occupation that was dying at the time yeah. he was writing about it, and was not particularly, you know, this was like it was not a glamorous occupation. It was like him writing about uh, garbage men. Yes, basically that, which is why a lot of people didn't care about it. Because Melville actually was on a whaler, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He, he jumped ship. Yes. But yeah, I read a lot of Melville uh, to do that, and and, um, and 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 frankly, he was quite. It was quite illuminating. It, 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 I read it as a like I said, I had a history. Uh, I, I was a history major, so I read it more like a like a historical document than a book. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's the best, probably the best way to to address it. Although the, all the stuff with Ahab is amazing. Yes. And Ahab is like if you read, if you just, it's like you have this like matter of fact thing about what it's like to be to suffer living on a whaling ship, and then you've got this character just shoved in the middle of it. <laughs> and it's like you know, this character out of Shakespeare. Yes. And and. Uh, and most people don't seem to realize it when he when he's Melville's talking about it. Um, he may, he, may, he drops a couple of mentions in it that that Ahab's the son of a witch. Right. I yeah yeah. There's there's stuff in there that's just like people just forget about it because they had to read it in high school. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But, yeah. But that, that, but then again, I I t- used that and I I actually wrote a. Uh, um, uh, short story for this thing called uh, Classics Mutilated, which was like various combining different right historical mashups. Yes, yes. yes. And, and mine was uh, a cross between um, Moby Dick and uh, the Wendigo. Yeah, the story of the Wendigo, yep. and and I have it where uh, Ahab is come. Ahab is dead. He's been dead for some time, and he is now bound to the devil as the devil's bounty hunter to or, or to go forth and bring him monsters for his amusement, for his little park that he wants to build. With the <laughs> one one monster for every soul that went down on his ship, and once he gets all those, he can he can go. He can be released, at least go into limbo and not be in hell. Yeah. Because when you read about it, Ahab really wasn't a bad man. He was just obsessed. Yes. And um. And and, and the the fact that he was responsible for killing his ship burns him. So, but but yeah, he's up, he's he's basically wandering around the Yukon with a harpoon looking for a Wendigo. <laughs> <laughs> And he finds one. He gets one. It's just like, it, and it, it it's, it was, uh, uh, it, it's an interesting story. I, uh, in classics mutilated, I believe it's called "From Hell's Heart." And um, uh, but yeah, I, I I'll say if I had to read Moby Dick three times, I'm going to get some mileage out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, that's priceless. Um, you also have gone into a bit of Southern Gothic with Knuckles and Tails. Yes. What do you think the appeal is of Southern Gothic as well, a sort of subgenre, if you like? 
Well, it's a it's a uniquely American um, subgenre. Yes. Much like the well, my, uh, somewhat akin to, but removed from the western. Yeah. It's like uh, the western is the heroic aspect of of the American experience. The Southern Gothic is a dysfunctional um, <laughs> yeah. um, side effect. Of that, uh, it's kind of like um, I would say the kind of like the spaghetti western mm-hmm. of the American experience. Um, yeah. It's the flip side. It's it's uh, the you know the experience of America is especially experienced by the and and especially with people like Flannery O'Connor, uh, William Faulkner, Carson McCullers, and the like. The the, the children and our grandchildren of the people who lost the Civil War. Yeah. And having to deal with that great sin and the and the and the sin of racism, the the scourge of poverty, and um, and just and the degradation that comes from that of, of also just being of also having to like carry that sin and suffer the sins of your fathers and your forefathers. Um, and some people you know, refusing to suffer the sins. Yes, as we've been do- see, dealing see with that recently, lately. Yes, <laughs> yes. As, and we've been dealing with that recently here in the last yes. two weeks. Um, I myself, my great grandfather fought in the Civil War and had his lower jaw blown off. There's trouble at the age of eighteen, and lived. He lived to be in his thirties. Um. Uh. With the prosthesis. Yes. And people go, um, it's my heritage. Yeah, well, I know what my heritage is. And my heritage crippled my great grandfather and you know, and it wasn't worth it. Yeah. You know. So um yeah, you know, that that that's my whole um, my whole attitude to that. And most of my Southern Gothic stories are set in Arkansas where I grew up. And I grew up in, in the New South. I grew up uh as segregation was finally breaking and Jim Crow was breaking, my, the, my earliest memories are of race riots and um, things like Dr. Uh, Dr. King's assassination. I was like yeah. eight or nine. Uh, K- Kennedy, uh, Kennedy being assassinated. That I, this one of the first things I can remember is watching his funeral on television. And uh, so all of that, turmoil um, was part of my childhood and also watching adults that the adults in my life sometimes act like complete and utter maniacs and um, and when I was my gra- my father was the uh, deputy sheriff of this very small town like 300 400 people in Arkansas mm-hmm. uh, and he basically got the job because he was the only one willing to take it. He needed yeah. the extra money. He was also the fire chief. All right. know, so he he had four kids. He needed the money. <laughs> and um, and uh, when he took over as the uh, lawman there, uh, the leader of the clan came over to him and said, if you get any black fellas in here, you call us first. You don't call the state police. And my father's response was, I don't take orders from – and I can't repeat what he said. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we were targeted by the Klan. And when I, you know, I was like six. I, I was in first grade. And I was walking home, and these guys in a pickup truck uh, were pacing me, you know, s- you know, shouting and saying all kinds of ugly stuff to me and, and – threatening my daddy, threatening me. And I went home and I was like in hysterical. Cause when you're a kid, when adults do shit like the, like mm. that to you, you, you assume it's something you've done. Yes. You don't understand. You, you, you personalize, you internalize it. And, um, and then, um, that night the clan showed up in our lawn, tried to set up a, uh, set up a cross. And my, by that point, my daddy knew what was going on. 
and he called his brother, my uncle Bo, who was uh, who had uh, had a silver star from uh, Second World War. He was he was a war hero. He'd been um, he'd seen action in at D Day and Market Garden and mm-hmm. liberated Dachau. He was at the Battle of Beston, and uh, he was there with his gun. And and my daddy called him out. He said, oh, "State police is on the way," and he backed him down. And um, and then my grandfather, my mother's father, she called him, and he was the vice president of the bank. And he said, and "He says, I know, I know everybody who's in the clan here." So he just called in all their loans. <laughs> <laughs> And they left us alone after that. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. that was, you know, so that's my experience with the South. And that's why, and that's where, where my Southern Gothics kind of come out of. Yeah. And, and most of mine are also supernatural in element. And, but, but there's also that very real human el- evil element to it yeah. as well. So, I, you know, I got, I got to get, I got to look at it up close and personal as a child. So, and I, and I've been seeing it every, every now and again as an adult so you're listening to the weird tales radio show with charles christian what projects are you working on at the moment well right now uh, i've got something that's brewing in hollywood that i'm not allowed to talk about right fair (laughs) enough no (laughs) i think i think it's bad luck to talk about things like that in hollywood until you've actually yeah, yeah. Till the fat lady's sung, and they've also given you a large amount of money, yes. Until not only the fat lady sung, but she signed her name on a piece of paper. Yep. Um, on a contract. And um, and I've got – but uh, Craig and I are have been, for the better part of a year, have been um, working on the story of um, – what we hope will be a magnum opus, um, called The Adventures of Captain Finn, about a lesbian female, uh, lesbian mermaid pirate captain um, and her crew of uh, mythological creatures that uh, sail, the, sail the open seas of the, of, uh, of the 17th and 18th century, mm-hmm. uh, looking for a homeland um, uh, away from away from us bothersome humans. Yes, and because um, we have well, apparently we have a bad habit of like you know, of capturing them and trying to sell them into indentured or slavery, um, and um, so they're trying to find a find a place of their own. And um, but it's it's um, you, know, you know it's it's like I said. Uh, Finn is the mermaid captain, and and she's got her um, her first mate, who's a minotaur, um, and she's got um, her best friend slash pet. Instead of a parrot, she has a has a sentient octopus that plays an accordion. That plays an accordion, and sea shanties will be involved. <laughs> so. Well, sea shanties are apparently trending on TikTok at the moment. So yeah, uh, God, I know a friend of mine just did did his his sea shanty uh, TikTok and YouTube thing yeah. with his daughter. He dresses as a, as, a, as a pirate on on a regular basis, and so does Craig, for that matter. <laughs> That's <laughs> one of his things. He likes to dress up as a as a pirate. Uh, I'm a descendant of a of an actual pirate. Uh, or, or pri- oh, actually, privateer, freebooter, uh, whatever you want to call it. He wasn't a pirate pirate. Yeah. He had a license from the United States to be a pirate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, privateer, yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Captain Crow. That was his actual name. Actually, uh, Captain Moses Crow. Well, that's spe- – expe- they had great names in those days, didn't they? Oh, yes. He was uh, part Scottish, part American Indian. His His father was Scottish. And his mother happened to be living there at the time in Kentucky when she showed up. And she was she was a Crow Indian, and uh, Moses never had a last name because yeah. he was illegitimate. And when he signed on as a cabin boy when he was like fourteen years old, he decided he wanted to go off to sea, and he signed his name and goes, "Well, what's your last name, boy? What your surname? What?" And he goes, "What are you?" And he goes, well, "I'm a Crow." 
you know, he meant Crow India. And then yeah. you go, okay, Moses Crow. <laughs> That's how the Crow, Crow side of the family got their name. <laughs> so. That's wonderful. I won't take up any more of your time. Been a delight talking to you. All right, well, you take care. Will do indeed. Bye now. All right, bye-bye. Once again, a big thank you to this week's guest, Nancy A. Collins. You can find all her books on Amazon, and she even has a page on Wikipedia. You'll also find both those links on our urbanfantasies.com website. Incidentally, you'll also notice during the interview that Nancy mentioned her creative partner, Craig. This is the artist Craig Hamilton, who has worked on such projects as Aquaman, Fables and Spectre. At the end of December just gone, Craig had a bad fall and smashed his ankle bones. Now he is facing major surgery, but doesn't have health insurance, because he's a freelance artist, and he lives in the United States. So Nancy has set up a GoFundMe page to help pay for his medical bills. You can also find a link to this on the show's website. And that's just about it. But before we go, here's another ghost haunting date for your diary. The ghost is that of Lady Gertrude Wintour, who haunts her former home, Huddington Court, near Worcester, in the west of England, where she mourns the passing of her husband, Robert Wintour, who was gruesomely executed in 1606 for his part in the gunpowder plot to blow up the Houses of Parliament and kill King James I. Gertrude's ghost is said to be seen every 30th of January, which is the anniversary of Robert's execution by being hanged, drawn and quartered. Lovers of irony may appreciate the fact that 43 years later, on the 30th of January 1649, King James' son, King Charles I, lost his head when he was executed by the forces of Oliver Cromwell and the Parliamentary Party. Now it just remains for me to say this is Charles Christian saying thank you for listening in. Please join me again next time. Until then, stay well, stay weird. Goodbye. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, folklore, and the paranormal. You can keep in touch with us online at www.urbanfantasist.com, by email to urbanfantasist at icloud.com, and on Twitter at Urban Fantasist. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Goodbye. <laughs>